Hi, and welcome to the 15th installment of The Dad Project. Glad to have you back, and tonight we follow Pete Purvis to his next adventure as the engineering test pilot for the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. We'll get to some particulars shortly, but we'll start here with how he described his time at Westinghouse on his resume. I performed flight tests on various air-to-air -air weapon systems, additionally acted as deputy program manager of the Earth Resources Program, which provided remote radar sensing data to numerous oil and mineral companies and governments. Personally planned flights, marketing strategy, resource allocation, and the budgeting for this 20-man program. Sold 500k of business and negotiated contracts throughout the world directed crew field activities and flew numerous flights of radar-equipped DC-6B airplane in the U.S., Panama, Australia, New Guinea, and Indonesia. He oddly leaves out the F-4J that had been bailed to Westinghouse to test Westinghouse's air-to-air -air radar for that plane. And in any case, before we get started, let's hear Orson Welles recite John Gillespie's High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and dance the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept height with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of faith, put out my hand and touch the face of God. Radar is defined as a radio location system that uses radio waves to determine the distance, ranging, angle, azimuth, and radial velocity of objects relative to the emitter site. It is used to detect and track aircraft, ships, spacecraft, guided missiles, motor vehicles, and to map weather formations and terrain. Exciting stuff, I know. And to delve a bit further, it was a German physicist, Heinrich Hertz, who was the first to find that radio waves could be reflected from solid objects in 1886. A few years later, it would be another German, Christian Hulsmeyer, who was able to detect the presence of distant metal objects, but not how distant that object was from the emitter. These early discoveries were enough to pique the interest of scientists, engineers, and militaries around the world that would result in the incremental development both in public and in secret of radar systems that would eventually be used effectively in World War II. An early and tragic success of a radar system was the U.S. Army's Westinghouse SCR-270 radar on the morning of December 7, 1941. Located on Apano Point on the northern tip of Oahu, the system had been in a training mode for months when the station reported a large target to the intercept center at Fort Schaffner in Pearl Harbor. The operators had never seen a formation that large, but the timing and direction of the intercept was thought to be the expected arrival of six B-17s from California and the report dismissed. The large formation was in fact the 183 aircraft that made up the first wave of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The radar operators had detected the first wave 45 minutes before their arrival over Pearl Harbor, but to no avail. One of the major innovators and producers of radar systems came on the back of an unlikely innovation. In 1869, at the ripe old age of 22, George Westinghouse invented an air brake system for locomotives that would soon become the industry standard. His fortune was made, and in 1886, he had formed the Westinghouse Electric Company. It is thanks to Westinghouse that our homes are powered through an alternating current system and not Thomas Edison's direct current system. The success furthered his fortune and his companies diversified into many different industries and would become a many tentacled industrial beast by the mid 20th century. One of those divisions was the radio division, a division initially responsible for the development of radio equipment, but steadily shifted throughout World War II to radar systems. 
In 1938, the radio division was consolidated from its two locations in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania to Baltimore, Maryland. It was here that the radio division would develop the highly secret SCR-270 radar system that succeeded in detecting the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, but was failed miserably by its human handlers. The SCR-70 would be used and refined throughout World War II. In addition, Westinghouse would develop 50 other systems during the war. My father's career as a pilot to this point was as an end user of radar systems, not someone who tested them. In fact, the focus of his job search was not to be a test pilot, but to be an airline pilot. However, the job market would not be in his favor. In the Air Transport Association of America Facts and Figures report for 1968, they showed revenue passenger miles just shy of 100 billion for 1967. And it was projected that by 1977, that figure would be around 275 billion revenue passenger miles. Their projection for 1977 was dead on, but that didn't translate to airline pilot jobs in 1968. By 1967, the same report also noted that jet aircraft had almost completely replaced piston and turboprop aircraft on scheduled U.S. airlines. One trips Pan Am and Howard Hughes' TWA, among others, had gone all in on jet aircraft. This, along with several other factors like World War II veteran pilots aging out of consideration, the military only training enough pilots to cover attrition caused a pilot shortage from 1965 to the end of 68. Long story short, my dad's hopes for a pilot slot in an airline came up empty. He was, however, a rare breed of pilot, an engineering test pilot. How rare, you might ask? There are presently around 617,000 licensed pilots in the U.S. The Society of Experimental Test Pilots, that includes international members, reports a membership role of 2,200 test pilots that include test pilots that are no longer active. Without qualifying the 2,200 test pilots on the SCTP's membership rules, test pilots currently make up 0.4% of all pilots in the U.S. This is a long way round to say that in 1968, when my dad entered the civilian market, a bad market for airline pilots, his introduction to the possibility of working for Westinghouse was probably through an acquaintance. I can only guess because I don't know. In an odd confluence, despite once again flying as a test pilot, he would be logging most of his flight time at Westinghouse in one of the airline business's prop age workhorses, the DC-6B. In the 14th installment, I outlined how the end of World War II jump-started the American airline business with surplus aircraft and thousands of experienced pilots. Along with that were several newer aircraft that were outgrowths of pressurized aircraft developed for the Army Air Force. Several of these aircraft would define the heyday of the airline prop age that followed World War II and that would end in the early 60s. One of those planes was the Lockheed C-69 Constellation. That was an outgrowth of their Model 44 Excalibur. The design of the Excalibur began in 1937. It was to be a pressurized four-engine airliner that would only reach mock-up stage. Initial funding for the Excalibur would be provided by Howard Hughes, who had recently gained control of Transcontinental and Western Air, better known as TWA. He immediately changed the design parameters for the Excalibur that would require a serious redesign. Hughes met with three of Lockheed's design team that included Chief Research Engineer Kelly Johnson to outline his desires and needs for the new plane. The design would be so different that it was redesignated as the Model 49 Excalibur A. When the design was finalized, it would be forever known as the Lockheed 49 Constellation and present itself as one of the most beautiful, svelte, and graceful aircraft to ever grace the skies. 856 of these beauties would be built before the production line closed in 1958. As graceful and as beautiful as the Constellation was, the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser would best be described as the Connie's pug-nosed, heavyset younger brother. It was a direct outgrowth of the C-97 Stratofreighter that was itself a direct outgrowth of the B-29 Superfortress. It was larger than the Constellation and the DC-6B, and to move that large mass through the air, it was fitted with the largest and last of the Pratt & Whitney Wasp radial engines, the R-4360 Wasp Major. The launch customer would be one Trips Pan American World Airways, better known as Pan Am, with an order for 20 of the Stratocruisers. 
Unfortunately, the Stratocruiser proved to be an expensive aircraft to operate and unreliable due to the R4360 engines. When all was well with the plane, it did most things better than the Constellation and the DC-6B. But that was rarely the case, and only 56 units were built, with Boeing absorbing $7 million in losses. The DC-6B is the middle child of this tripartite, so overlooked it didn't even get a fancy name, just DC-6. Simple lines, reliable engines, rugged airframe that made it a darling of the airlines of the time, and with its relative simplicity it was operated by numerous secondary and tertiary airlines, after most major carriers had switched to jets and turboprops. To further drive the point home, the DC-6 was operated by 25 military air forces and as an airliner in 77 countries. Everett Air Cargo in Alaska still operates the DC-6 for cargo, while the Flying Bulls out of Austria fly a beautifully restored DC-6B that was once used by General Tito of Yugoslavia. Now, pulling all these threads together, my dad had uprooted our family from Poway, California, across the country to a quirky community called Sherwood Forest outside Annapolis, Maryland, and a short commute to the Westinghouse plant close by Friendship Airport in between Baltimore and DC. An airline job was not to be. He was still an engineering test pilot, an exclusive club by any definition, and he would be flying a King Air 90, an F4J, and a DC-6B while at Westinghouse. Ultimately, he would spend nearly as much time flying the DC-6B, 512 hours, as he did in the F4, 520 hours. In any case, as a new hire at Westinghouse, he was now responsible flying and or scheduling the test flights for air-to-air -air radar systems as well as the early development of side-looking aerial radar, SLAR, as a commercially marketable system for Westinghouse. Westinghouse would mount the SLAR in a long tube beneath the fuselage of the DC-6B as seen in this image. Westinghouse's DC-6 had begun its life in the livery of Pan Am when it was delivered on August 15, 1953. Registration November 6105 Charlie, and known as the Clipper Sam Houston, and later as the Clipper Nuremberg. In 1968, it was withdrawn from use and stored in Miami, and released into the myriad and often murky world of the used aircraft market. First taken over by Air Lease Corporation out of Los Angeles on September 17, 1968, it was then transferred to the Pacific Air Motive Corporation out of Burbank, California, in October of 1968 before finally being acquired by Westinghouse on February 24, 1969. Somewhere in the span of five months before Westinghouse bought the DC-6, it had ended up at Santa Monica Airport, where my dad would take it up for a familiaration flight on February 7th of 68. After several more flights out of Santa Monica, he would make a seven and a half hour flight to San Antonio Airport in Texas, then a short hop to New Orleans, and finally to Baltimore on the 23rd. As mentioned earlier, my dad was an end user of radar systems as a military pilot. After receiving his Navy wings, my dad was assigned to VP-32 that flew S2Fs. The tracker was outfitted with an AN-APS-38 pulse radar that was used to locate stationary objects. In this case, it was looking for submarine masts. With no Doppler capability, it could only give the masts initial position and not determine movement. Its tail could be extended for the Magnetic Anomaly Detector, MAD, the AN-ASQ-8, that was used to locate submarines by the hull's disruption of the Earth's magnetic signature. His time in Vietnam was spent in F-4Bs that were outfitted with a Westinghouse AN-APQ-72 fire control radar, the first solid-state radar system ever made. For target acquisition and for guidance of radar-guided air-to-air -air weapons like Sparrow and Sidewind, as the pilot of the aircraft, he was not responsible for the operating these systems. His job was to fly the plane to the best advantage of the system, and in the case of the S-2, to move the plane to coordinates given him by the crewman operating the system. Once receiving crew input, he was then responsible for weapons delivery. All of this was very practiced and coordinated. Now, working at Westinghouse, he would be responsible for the continued development of the latest version of the AWG-10 fire control radar system for the F-4J. However, while at Westinghouse, he concentrated on the civilian use of side-looking airborne radar, SLAR. 
Unlike radar that uses radio waves from its emitter, the SLAR system used microwave energy that is self-illuminating. This allowed for imagery that could be obtained either during the day or night. Additionally, microwave energy penetrates most cloud cover, so the SLAR can be used to map cloud covered areas. The microwave energy was emitted perpendicular to either side of the flight path, thus the term side looking, and this also allowed for a three-dimensional modeling of the scanned area. In Westinghouse's annual report of 1968, the SLAR system was described as follows. Another non-military spin-off from defense technology is the development of aircraft side-looking radar mapping equipment, which has many commercial uses, including the discovery of natural resources. In use over Vietnam, side-looking radar systems produced maps of near photographic quality, with radar pulses reflected from wide areas of terrain on either side of the aircraft. The radar maps show and detail every hill, stream, ravine, and man-made structure. The system, which works in darkness, clouds, fog, or rain, has obtained the first aerial pictures of perpetually cloud-covered Darien Province in Panama. The DC-6B was ideally suited for demonstrating and using the system. For one, the system was easily mounted to the fuselage of the aircraft. Additionally, all the system's support equipment to monitor and record data was easily housed in the aircraft. Its long range proved useful in two ways. Firstly, it could spend hours mapping large areas of terrain instead of numerous shorter flights by a less capable aircraft. Secondly, as my father worked to find customers for what Westinghouse was selling, many of those buyers were in areas of the world that would require the DC-6 to fly over vast expanses of the Pacific Ocean just to get there. Long flights that the DC-6 had been designed for. Over a period of a year and a half, his logbook is filled with notations for his flights in the DC-6, with notes like lost engines, problematic engines, and APU problems. But these were small details of a plane that flew all over the states and the world. Two weeks were spent in Colombia flying out of Cali to map the surrounding jungles. A week was spent demonstrating the system to Citgo, Humble Oil, Homestake Mining Company, and NASA. And finally, the plane spent nearly five months in Australia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. The following tells tale of my dad's time in Australia, and was gleaned from an article written by Mike Wood writing about the history of the Adastra Aerial Survey Company that flew out of Mascot Field in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. Westinghouse first contacted Adastra in January of 1970 about a possible liaison to map large areas of Western Australia with the SLAR system to map the geological makeup of the area. Wood met with my dad, who we elevated to full Australian status by referring to him as Peter, and he, my dad, and the Australian Westinghouse rep, Wallace Riley, came to terms to fly the DC-6 out of Perth for the proposed survey. When Wood met the plane at Mascot Field, his first surprise was to see how many passengers were on the plane. The second surprise was to realize that the 13 people, made up of two pilots, a navigator, a flight engineer, an operations manager, two mechanics, and six technicians were the crew. For someone used to a small plane with two crew members, Wood was a bit incredulous. To further his disbelief was that the DC-6 was fitted with numerous bunks, dining and lounge areas, full galley, coffee maker, and a Coca-Cola dispenser. To make up for it, my dad would ask Wood to be the navigator on the flights as the Westinghouse navigator was brought on for the navigational challenges of long ocean flights and was not familiar with the navigational challenges of survey flights. Wood was very familiar with the navigational techniques and the Doppler system that was also being used. Over a three-day period and approximately 30 hours of flight time, the aerial survey was completed. Wood then escorted my dad and several others to meet with the Department of National Mapping, Bureau of Mineral Resources, and the Army in Sydney. All three offices availed themselves of Westinghouse's services, but this is the end of Wood's story. And then, finally, on July 22, 1970, he and his crew packed up and left out of Honoria in the Solomon Islands and headed the 1,006 miles to Nadi, Fiji. From there, it was a short 714 miles to Pago Pago in American Samoa, where they took on as much fuel as possible for the final 2,600 miles to Honolulu. This was 18 hours of flying in one day, with my dad spending 14 of those hours as first pilot. He would spread the final 22 and a half hours of flight time to Baltimore over a three-day period. 
Arriving in Baltimore, he taxied the DC-6 to Westinghouse's operations center at Friendship Airport, shut down the engines on what would be his last flight in November 6105 Charlie. November 6105 Charlie would spend another couple of years at Westinghouse before it was put back on the market. It would be modified as a freighter for Air Chicago Freight, spend time as an airliner for Pan African Airplanes, but before making its way to the Panamanian airline in Air Panama, where it would be scrapped in 1981 after spending 28 years in the air. I suspect my dad was disappointed that an airline job never materialized, but that disappointment would be forgotten when sometime in 1970 or early 1971 the phone rang. It was the call that all test pilots dream of, a hot new fighter in need of testing. It was also the call that would lead to one fateful flight that would be his most memorable and well-known in the test pilot community and beyond. So, until next time when we head for Calverton, Long Island, where we will all stand in awe of the F-14 Tomcat, thanks for joining me for the 15th installment of the Dad Project. I continue to tell the stories I had hoped my father would tell me, and I appreciate you all being along for the journey. So please subscribe if you'd like to hear more, and until next time, thanks for watching and enjoy what life has given you. Ciao.